as amazing as Kubernetes is, anyone who's actually used it can tell you just how hard it is. Things break a lot, it's very complicated to deploy, and things that feel like they should be really simple very quickly become incredibly complicated. This video is going to be in two parts. In the first, we're going to talk about what Kubernetes is, and then we're going to very quickly deploy an EKS cluster that can be used for security testing. Let's get right into a high-level overview of what Kubernetes is. Virtualization is the first concept that really blew up the IT world in the sense that you could run multiple servers that were virtual within one set of hardware. So in a server room, you could stick one computer in there and run five different virtual machines off of it. As people grew larger and larger systems on the backbones of these virtual networks, there were a lot of management issues that came up as a result. It's really challenging to hire enough people and to build around the sort of complexity needed to run modern apps across your virtualized system. Combine that with the popularity of Linux and open source software, and there became a need to quickly deploy and manage fleets and fleets of Linux servers to maintain applications that were distributed around the globe. This pace for development accelerated even faster with advents of cloud and dockerization. Really dockerization in its simplest form, you can think of a server that you're snapshotting the hard drive and taking a picture of it, and then you can deploy as many copies of that wherever you need it to be. So this is a very common configuration method, deployment method, for managing a large number of servers. Essentially a Docker image is just a set of instructions that build that image over time. And so you can declare it as code, you can write a Docker file that says start with this base image, which could be a base Ubuntu image, which is most common. And then from there, you're adding in additional things to install to finally you're adding in your code that's actually running your application, your web server, your API, whatever it is, that's built into a Docker image that you can then deploy. You can think of a Docker image the same as a snapshot. So just as before you were able to take snapshots of application states and then large scale deploy them, same thing with Docker where you're able to build one container and that goes into your container registry which is hosted somewhere, and then it's deployed elsewhere. So to get to Kubernetes, just Docker by itself allows you to have a large number of Ubuntu hosts, right? Pretend you have a fleet of just 10 Linux servers. From there, you wanna run 10 states of your application. So you could just run a Docker image on each of those servers and call it a day. But when you do that, you know you're wasting a lot of resources, right? There's a lot of things on that base Ubuntu image. There's a lot of processing power that's not getting used likely if you're just running one image. And so you want the ability to move these images around, especially if you're not just hosting one web application, but numerous microservices that are all talking to each other. From here, there's a need to deploy a large number of containers across your infrastructure and a way to manage and orchestrate that. And essentially that's what Kubernetes is. Kubernetes is just a way to orchestrate a large number of servers. But in reality, we know those servers are actually Docker containers and those Docker containers are running on servers. And so that's really the breakdown here is you have the Kubernetes control plane at the top. This is the API server that purely exists to orchestrate to say, I want five pods on this node. I want three pods on this node. We're not utilizing this one so we can take it offline to really orchestrate all the management of those systems. And then you have the nodes, which are the underlying server that's hosting a lot of Docker images. And then from there you have pods, which are what are ultimately running the containers inside of them. And so that's a lot of vernacular that you have to just get comfortable with over time that nodes host pods which host containers or reverse containers live inside pods, which live on nodes. And really from a security perspective, which is what I wanna jump into, there's a need to secure each layer of this paradigm. So you have the cloud hosting box itself. That cloud hosting box has things like users, permissions that you need to configure properly. That's the cloud security part. And then you have the Kubernetes API server, which if you're using a cloud provider, they're usually the ones hosting this for you. But if you were to do a different Kubernetes tutorial, you might actually set that up yourself and learn a little bit more about how it works. But if you're using something like EKS, which is Elastic Kubernetes Service from Amazon, they are hosting the control plane for you. And so you're actually focused on things like making sure that all applications to the Kube API server require authentication and authorization, that it's not open to the public, that the permissions are restricted on it. Those sorts of concerns that you would have securing the API layer itself. And then you have the node security because those nodes that are running the pods on them can be SSH'd into just like any other Linux server. They're just Linux servers. So there are some security concerns around there 
there. But really what is the biggest impetus is the pods and then the containers running those pods. Because if someone exploits your application to get into it, or if there's a misconfiguration somewhere in your software, that's usually what happens is an attacker gets inside the container and then finds a way to get to the nodes and then scrapes credentials to move laterally elsewhere in your environment. And usually these containers, because cloud is so open, it's not just that that container has access to itself. Usually they have direct access to other containers, to other cloud resources like S3 buckets or databases. And that's really where a lot of your secure information is, right? Your proprietary information in your code base, user information in RDS and your databases in S3. That's the security goal. So it's those three layers that we'll be talking through the next couple of videos. But really in this video, we're just gonna start with creating a cluster that I use to test security tools. And so we're not gonna go through the full deployment and understanding of those tools and what to look for. We're just gonna be spinning up a Kubernetes cluster within AWS and then using that cluster to run a vulnerable web application. And that's really the heart of what we'll be starting with today. So I'm gonna be going at kind of an intermediate level here in terms of what you need installed and configured and to be familiar with. So that assumes that you already have some kind of IDE installed, usually VS Code, that you already have Windows subsystem for Linux if you're on a Windows machine, or you're comfortable using things like Homebrew on your Mac to install developer packages. I've put a couple beginner tutorials for those basic prerequisite installs, but really the first major things you're gonna need are AWS CLI v2, Cube Control, which is a Kubernetes command line utility essentially and then something called EKS control which is sort of like a mixture of cube control and AWS CLI put together but with those three things the most important thing being that you're on the right version for everything that's really all we need to set up to get started the in-depth tutorial is available here on this website which is linked below which goes through both just the basic YAML setup that we are going to be using to deploy juice shop and then again here if you want to follow along to get cube control, I wouldn't suggest using these actual curls that are in here. They might work for you, but that's what got me into some of the different versioning issues is because I just sort of did it without thinking about what version I was currently on. Um, but instead just knowing, really using this for the YAML file and then knowing just some general commands to go through. So this tutorial is really great for doing what we're doing, deploying Juice Shop on EKS. So first we wanna log into the AWS console just to get a feel for what we're doing. Next, I'm not gonna show the whole process, but we're going to go into an IAM user, attach the administrator policy to them, and then generate AWS access keys and set them as environment variables at our command line. So here I'm using EKS control, which we installed earlier to actually run the create cluster job. By default, this is going to go ahead and create a new cluster using a decent sized nodes uh, with a scaling group. And so what's really important to note for later is that whenever you're not using this cluster, we'll set the auto scale down to zero, just as a quick way to scale down the cluster. What you can see here is I just forgot to export the access keys before I did this. So I'll run the export command to make it so that these are accessible at the command line level. Now that we've got that set up, I'll rerun the create cluster command. And you can see here, what it's doing essentially is creating a new cluster with a cloud formation template. And so this is just a fast, easy way to get this stuff deployed. Um, it's doing a lot of other stuff in the background that AWS will do for you as well. If you wanted to do it through the console, you could do it as well. Again, all we're doing really here is trying to create a EKS cluster in the easiest way. So if I go in here and go to EKS, you can see that the cluster has started to spin up. So don't worry, that step can take a while. So while it's loading, let's click into the CloudFormation stack where you can actually see what's happening here in a more granular level if you're interested. Essentially what EKS is doing is spinning up nodes, a node group, a VPC for them to connect to the internet, an auto-scaling group for the EC2 instances. So really EKS is spinning up a lot of native AWS resources and we can see granularly what is getting spun up here. But at the end of the day, the reason we don't dive too much into this is because you're just creating a cluster that you're going to be able to connect to with Cube Control here in a minute when it finishes. Again, this can take a little bit. In the meantime, let's actually dive in to take a look at what we'll be deploying to this cluster, which is OWASP Juice Shop. Um, so this Juice Shop app is a famous app in the world of application security because it's a well-documented list of exploits that you can run against a web application. So a lot of sales engineers will use this. It's a very standard way to test different things. And so that has its pros and cons, right? The pro is that you're getting great results from it. The con is that everyone's going to have content to detect the things in this because it is 
so common as a, as a testing benchmark. And so what you can see here is we're just checking when you pull that image name with the juice shop at the end, just verifying where that Docker image is from and validating that it's getting built from this GitHub repository, right? Whenever you're following a tutorial from the internet, you should just take this extra step to when you're deploying an image, just make sure that it's actually the official image and not just some branch of it. So here's like a demo of what the juice shop app's gonna look like when we deploy it. And essentially, again, just a lot of very easily exploitable things that are really great in that it's all documented here for you. And so when you run through your security testing, you can go ahead and just use this to make sure that it's detecting things that you want. So here I'm going to skip through a couple things that broke for me and just show you where it worked when it deployed it. I made a few novice mistakes. The first was I had AWS CLI v1 installed instead of v2 because that was just the default version that was on my Windows uh, subsystem for Linux that I didn't notice. The other thing was that my cube control version was too new compared to my EKS version. And so I updated the EKS cluster instead of downgrading my cube control. So those are just two things to keep in mind. But if you're doing a fresh install, you probably won't run into these problems. The key thing to see here is that I have done the create juice shop YAML. And so this deployed the image and then I got the pods to verify that the pod is indeed running and got the service now to go ahead and show that now I have a port that's listening, right? So this is listening on port 8000 and it's watching for traffic. So now I'm going to use the K port forward tool to essentially create a tunnel. If you want to think of it that way between my CLI to that pod. And so I'm mapping the ports here so that essentially whenever I go onto port 8080 locally, it's going to open up the juice shop, which is deployed. So what I've essentially just done is created an instance of juice shop running locally on my cluster. And this really opens a ton of exciting security testing <sighs> potential. And we're gonna really dive into that in the next few videos in terms of what can we do to intentionally make this configuration less secure from a configuration scanning standpoint, but then what else can we do to actually run container-based testing to see what sort of alerts fire and our ability to tell the story. One last step that I really wanted to show, because if you don't do this, the cluster is going to end up costing you probably about $50 a month, is if you, when you're done, come down to this auto scaling group and then go to the group that was created and edit the desired capacity to be zero and the minimum capacity to also be zero. And this will go ahead and have the auto scaling group scale down so that you don't have any running instances. And so that's how, when you are ready to test your juice shop again, you can just change that back up to one and restart. Um, that'll bring back in the pods and everything that you need to do the testing. I hope you're as excited as I am to have a working cluster that we can use and play with for real security testing. This is one of my favorite things to do because we can bring in new tools and really see granularly what they're doing. So in the next video, we're gonna be taking a look at a couple of different tools that are different levels of paid and just really compare and see what results they have when we test them using this method. In many ways, this video has been a continuation of how to break into cybersecurity. I strongly believe that getting hands-on with containers and Kubernetes is really the way to elevate your security career to the next level. A lot of people have SIM experience, security analyst experience, almost none of them. The subset is so small of security engineers who have hands-on experience with Kubernetes. So if you wanna go back and watch that video while you wait for the next one, it's right here.